It helps when you turn these things on, you know. Good morning. Welcome. Let's stand and sing together. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service? Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. this morning for your presence for your work of creation not just of all things but of us our lives and families for your recreation of us in Christ we worship you today father we worship you and you alone in Jesus name we pray amen you may be seated good morning we're so glad you're here today very special day. We're going to do a lot of recognitions today. We're going to begin with a recognition of a couple of our senior saints. And this is going to be a regular feature of our church over the next several years, recognizing people 
while they are with us. You know, I started thinking, and some have been talking about this, and there's kind of a thing going on now, and you may not realize this, but you know how we get together at funerals and we talk about what great people these people were. And, oh, look at her, she looks so good laying there and she's dead, and yeah, I wish you could have, I wish you could have heard all the nice things she, we said about her today. Well, what we're gonna do, we're gonna do some of that today. So we're gonna have two of our senior saints, Letha, and Dolores are going to come forward. So why don't you all come forward now? And if you need someone to come with you and help you navigate this, that's fine. And I told them we are not in any hurry. And the family said, good, because hurry and this woman doesn't fit together anymore. And that's all right. And uh, Letha Burton and Dolores Brents have been part of our church for many years. <laughs> if one of you want to walk down with Letha, that's all right. Unless she told you, I do not want that. <laughs> They're mumbling to each other about how they can't get along, and of course we know, and we're there. And uh, you know, I, I found myself saying to somebody one time, I'm not critical of the old people, I wanna be one someday. And, and that's true, isn't it? You know, this is, uh, I, I wanna be those people that have been around forever and have invested my life in good things and serving the kingdom. And, and these two are kinda who I want to be when I grow up. Letha has been part of our church forever. When did you join our church, Letha? I was nine years old. I don't know what year that was. Okay, a few though. Dolores, how about you? I don't remember the date. Okay, has it been a while? Oh, yes, uh-huh. Approximately. Oh, 1950. 1950, things have changed just a little bit. All right, well, we're not gonna fact check you here, all right? <laughs> Yeah, and Letha and Dolores have been part of almost every aspect of our ministry for as long as most of us can remember. And if you've been to any of our meals, you've tasted her pies, yeah. right? And if you've been into the office, you saw Dolores at work and she's been a counter and worked in various different things. And these are the kinds of people that we use to get things done, aren't they? They're just here. When you think of the people of First Baptist Church, these are two of them that are pillars. And they're not perfect, of course. We're not gonna blow smoke in anybody's way or anything like that. But some of them are close, aren't they? And they have days, they're just like us. But these are the kinds of people that God uses to build churches. We understand that our foundation is our faith in Jesus. And these two women reflect that faith. But we also understand that human institutions that God has built are based upon good people, flawed as they are, but committed to God and those kinds of things. So today we're, we have gifts in there in the bags and we're gonna get those, but I'm not gonna present all those and show you what they are, but they're just plaques, something they can hang on the wall and, and things like that. And I'll just read one of them. In appreciation, this certifies that Letha Burton and Dolores Brents has been recognized for her lifetime of service to our Lord through her involvement in the ministries of First Baptist Church, Independence, Missouri. Your commitment to the cause of Christ and your willingness to serve in whatever ways possible will forever serve as a model of Christ-like behavior to all who would follow him. And the passage of scripture at the bottom is this. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I was talking to Brian, our pianist earlier, talking about a couple of old guys reflecting on the way the world is changing and going to hell in a handbasket and you know all those things. You know how us old people talk. And one of the things that our generations are beginning to lose is those models of behavior that teach us just by being how to act, how to think, and how to talk. And so these two ladies represent that generation that has done such good in teaching others how to act just by being who they are. Again, everybody knows that no one's perfect and you know we tend to shine off the flaws and ignore all that stuff. These are just two really fine people that God has worked in, that God has used, that God has blessed. And God has used these two to bless us, hasn't he? And this is the way God works. And when you wanna know, well, how should I act? How should I do? How should I be as Christian? Looking at people like these two is one way to do it. Biblical teachings sometimes seem obtuse and unclear and you wonder what the preacher's talking about and you just wish he would stop talking because you're hungry and need to go to the bathroom. I get it. 
But you can look at these two people year in, year out, and get a sense of the way God has worked. Like I said, we've got gifts here for them. And I'm going to ask that somebody from each family come. And Tammy, I'm going to have you carry the horses back just so you can get this. But we're going to have a word of prayer for them. So why don't you stand with me as we pray for these two saints. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for these two saints of yours. These two people in whom you have done a good work. You have used them for decades in service to your kingdom. They have loved and been loved. They've represented Christ in many situations. They've given freely of their time and energies. Father, we thank you for them. Continue to be with them as the days go by. Encourage them and their families in this day. Thank you, Father, for giving us good people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give them a round of applause if you would, please. card there you go there you go all right and as they're making their way back I guess we'll continue with the worship services and when you see these people after the services just let them know you love them and appreciate their witness to us thank you ladies let's continue on in worship won't you be seated Dave's gonna come and do the children's message we are in the middle of a month of thankfulness, right ladies? We've been thinking about things that we're thankful for and we certainly are thankful for those good ladies that have served our church for many years. So can you guys think of any other things that we've um, said that we were thankful for? We've been making a tree downstairs and when it started, we just had some branches up there, right? It's pretty bare kind of looks sad. It's just this brown thing up on our wall. Then we started filling it up with leaves, right? Colorful leaves. We wrote some things that we're thankful for. Now it looks beautiful, right? Covers our whole wall. Can you think of some things that you were thankful for? Can you share one of those people or? Yeah. My grandma? My grandma and Beba. Your grandma and Beba, huh? Yeah, thankful for them. You guys want to share one that you thought of? Friends? Did you guys were thankful for friends? Yeah, how about your teachers? You list your teachers on there, right? Yeah, we thought of all kinds of people, our church family, right? There's a little prayer that I'm going to give you that I'm going to close with that mentions the other thing that we studied this morning, and that was we are thankful for God's love, right? I think we called it his love endures forever, right? No matter what, how young we are, how old we are, right? How much energy we have, what we've done, if we've been nice or mean, right? Or if we've been lazy, whatever. He doesn't stop loving us, okay? So why don't you bow your heads and I'll read this prayer to you and then you can take this prayer back to your seat. Father, Father, up above, thank you, thank you for your love. Thank you for my parents and my teachers too. I can see and know these things came from you. Father, Father, up above, thank you, thank you for your love. Thank you for my meals and my warm bed, too. I can see and know these things came from you. Father, Father, up above, thank you, thank you for your love. Thank you for my friends, old and new. I can see and know these came from you. Thank you, Father, for your gifts to me. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship God together. Let me hear you sing out loud. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. 
kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord? Just what we 
Open your Bibles with you this morning, if you would, to the book of Romans in your New Testament. Book of Romans chapter 8, a very familiar chapter. Romans chapter 8, in your Gospels, and then the book of Acts, and then Romans. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 8, you can see on screen that we're still in the series that God's truth in the darkness at night or in the darkness of this life. You may have expressions and not know what to do with them. And today you can see on screen that the expression I'm done is one of the things we're going to talk about. What are we supposed to do as Christians when we don't want to do it anymore? It being marriage or job or putting up a church, etc. We've all known people that have just walked away from jobs or marriages or sometimes church out of frustration with people or with themselves. So we're going to talk today about how that is one of those things that is just part of the human experience and there is a way that our faith can help us deal with those very feelings and situations. So Romans chapter 8, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about God's sovereignty today and how that works and how that can give us hope. And we're also going to talk about just ways that God gives us to deal with some of the hard times of life. As always, we begin with prayer. We pray a lot in worship services. Remember that prayer is when God gives you a chance to talk to him. The old language is appropriate here. In ancient cultures, when you wanted to talk to the king, you had to go through a long process. And you didn't get to talk to him unless you had the process. If you, if you tried to push in and interrupt, he would kill you. It was that simple. But God as king gives us an opportunity to have audience with him. So when you pray, it means God's listening. Stops everything. In God's ways, he can pay attention to you and to that other guy at the same time. So today when you pray, understand that. I'll give you a few moments of prayer where you're seated. I'll close and we'll look at this passage together. Would you bow with me, please? Again, Father, we worship you. In this worship service, we celebrate... We recognize, we acknowledge your work in people's lives. You have gifted us with the presence of really fine people who have showed us how to live, who have demonstrated over the decades what faith can do, and you have worked with them and us. Thank you, Father. As always, we thank you for all good things. We know that your word teaches us that if we have anything worth having, it is gift from you. Thank you. And we especially thank you for this life of faith, for salvation, for forgiveness of sin, hope, and strength. Thank you. Father, as we speak of your gifts and your wonder, we acknowledge our sin. We ask for mercy and forgiveness. Our sin doesn't mean we're bad people. It just means we are imperfect and separated from you. Father, we confess our sin. We ask for mercy and forgiveness for the cleansing that only comes through Jesus. Thank you, Father, for that gift. This morning we pray for those that are struggling. Help them. For those that are sick, give them the healing. For those that are facing end of life and life change circumstances give them guidance and encouragement and hope and Lord as always we ask you to be especially with our first responders and soldiers and their families in this world their work is endless and they respond in tireless fashion thank you father for their gifts we ask that you would protect them use them to bring peace and justice to save lives, to give hope. 
and comfort they and their families, Father. We pray today for our, our government, for those people who have power over us. We pray that they might receive wisdom from you. That they would be able to think independently of partisan politics and the nonsense that is so much of our culture. We pray, Father, that our culture would turn back towards you, that we would recognize our foolishness for what it is and turn from it. We pray, Father, that Christians would stand up and be good people, people who represent Jesus, people who speak truth in grace and in love. We pray for those around the world who struggle in miserable circumstances. Work as only you can, Father. It's more than we can do. We cannot fix everything. Work, Father, and do what you can. Again, we thank you for all good things. Open our hearts to your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am out of here. Ever said it? That's how we say it today. It used to be, I quit. Take this job and shove it. You know, the whole thing. Now it's, I'm out of here. I listened to an interview with Quentin Lucas, mayor of Kansas City on NPR the other day. And they were talking about the various frustrations. You know, of course, he's got a big job and it's a tough job. And everybody loves him one day and they hate him the next. And that's just kind of the way it is in this culture. And they, the guy asked him, Quentin... I gotta ask, do you ever feel like just quitting and chucking it all and walking away? And he laughed and then he goes, well, yes, actually, I do. And then he said, but I know that what I'm doing is important and it affects a lot of people. But, but there are a lot of days that I go home and I just want to quit. But then he went into the politician speak and talked about how committed he was to people, etc., etc., like all politicians do. So who knows what the truth is? Good guy sometimes feels like quitting. I remember my wrestling coach would yell at me, he says, pain! And he would, if you grunted, you were a loser. A grunter is a loser! And, and he was my wrestling coach, and so if I grunted, he would yell at me that I was a loser if I grunted, and so on and so forth. And sometimes I wanted to quit because I grunted, and he told me I was a loser. Not necessarily good pedagogy for a coach, but you know, it worked for a high schooler. We all feel like quitting sometimes. So what we're going to do today is talk about what we as Christians can do when we feel like quitting. Interestingly enough, Paul the Apostle sometimes felt like quitting. And he knew when he wrote to churches that there were times when Christians felt like quitting. Quitting their lives, quitting their marriage, quitting their faith. It's just part of this experience on earth. Sometimes people just wanted to get away from the world. And he understood that. So today we're going to read a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8 where Paul talks to people in a good situation about what do you do, how do you handle this life that can really dump on you sometimes. Follow along with me if you would. Romans chapter 8. I'll read verse 18 and then 26 to 32. Romans 8, beginning at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now drop down to verse 26 if you would. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So we'll stop there. So simply put is the first idea. God's sovereign grace 
can give meaning and power to our lives is sovereign grace. A couple of big terms here. And these are terms that preachers fight about. So I'm going to try not to get too tedious and detailed here. But if you ever went to preacher school, and I don't necessarily recommend it, but if you ever went to preacher school, you would talk a lot about grace and sovereignty and all those kinds of things. So on screen are a couple of definitions. We can go to that next slide, please. God's sovereignty. God's absolute and overwhelming power over all things. What this means is God is absolutely in control over human history and the universe and all those kinds of things. Now that doesn't mean he necessarily makes everything happen. But he is in control and nothing happens that he doesn't understand and doesn't know how to fix. God is sovereign. And that's a very biblical Old Testament understanding. And what the Old Testament peoples had to learn was there was one God... And even when the world seemed like it was out of control and there were bad guys everywhere and the world looked like it was going to hell, that still there was comfort to be had because God was in control. I was trying to think of a way you could explain how someone is in control when they're really not in control or they don't necessarily control everything. I think of uh, the Chiefs head coach, Andy Reid. He's in control, right? And when he watches the games and he sees Tyreek Hill do something silly and he steps out of bounds or he drops the ball, he shakes his head. And then they ask him, and I always like the interviews with the coaches after the game is over, particularly when it's been a a bad game. And the coach goes, and Andy deadpans everything as his manner is. He goes, well, we're working on it, but we're going to be all right. And it's obvious that he's, he's frustrated, he's aggravated. But still, he's got a plan. He's going to work with these people. And next week is going to be different. And hopefully by the playoffs, things will be a lot better. So he's not in control in that. He doesn't necessarily direct everything. But from the head coach's perspective, he's got it under control. There is a plan at work. And his plan will be implemented this next week. And people have to respond, of course. So think of that and write that large. All right? So think of in in terms of eternity, not just Andy Reid and the Chiefs and that thing, but the guy who is in charge absolutely over all things. And that doesn't mean everything's perfect. It doesn't mean he's planning everything. But it does mean he's got this. And when you begin to understand that, the craziness of our culture and the absurdity of our world doesn't have to make sense And it doesn't have to terrify us because God is ultimately in control. So that's sovereignty. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And the other thing here is God's grace. The characteristic of God's character that leads him to love us, bless and use us, and offer the cleansing of sin through Jesus. God's sovereignty shows he's in control. God's grace means there is hope for you. Not just him, because he's a sinner. But you, the sinner, God understands. He loves you. He saw what you did last summer, like the movie. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you did. He saw what you didn't do. And you know what? He loves you anyway. And when you go to God in prayer, he listens to you. And when you ask for help, he will help you. When you ask for mercy, he gives you mercy. When you ask for forgiveness, he gives forgiveness. Not necessarily because you deserve it, but because of his grace towards us. You cannot change that. It is part of God's unchanging character. So God is sovereign and he's gracious. So those are two key terms. And again, these are preacher terms that we fuss over all the time. But still there are key terms that help you to understand some scripture. So when Paul wrote this passage... You know, it seemed like an odd thing because the church at Rome was a pretty good church. And you've got to remember that when you look at the New Testament, they were typically letters that Paul was writing to different churches. So when Paul looked at the church at Rome, he saw a good solid church in a nice community. It was wealthy. It was, uh, Rome was kind of at the top of their game at this point, about 65 AD or so. And things were going well. Christians in Rome were doing well. There was intermittent persecution throughout the empire. But in Rome at this time, they were doing pretty good. For a third world people in a first world situation, Christians were doing pretty good. 
It was considered a cult. We've talked about that. But they were tolerating Christians. And the Christians were making money. And they were wearing nice clothes and living in the nicer neighborhoods. And we went to church with Romans. And everything was good. And, and things weren't bad for these first century Christians. So in that situation, Paul wrote them about the sovereignty of God and how it gives you hope. Now here's a dirty little secret about some of the things we're going to talk about today. There are things that are best learned when things are going well. Because when you're upset, it's hard to learn. In fact, is if you understand humanity like, like we all do and we stumble into it over a period of years, when you are hurting, you do not need new information, do you? When you are struggling and you're crying and you've received a devastating diagnosis or you've lost someone, you don't want some preacher to come in and puke out a bunch of stuff that you've never heard before. What you want is to be reminded of something that you already know that has the potential to bring you comfort and hope. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. So today when we talk about some of these things, these are things that you don't want to necessarily bring up at a funeral home or in a discussion where there's been tragedy. There are other things. It doesn't mean they're inappropriate, but it means you've got to be careful. Uh, I think we've got time. I remember years ago at my first church, there was a young woman, and she was just a real sweetheart. And she was dying. And she had been dying for years. She had had multiple limbs cut off. She had some kind of problem with her circulatory system. And she had a foot removed and a leg removed and both hands and lost an eye. And she was dying as we watched. And I made a pastoral visit right after I got there. And one of my deacons blurted out, well, you know, God's in control. There is always grace and mercy right here for that. And I remember thinking, shut up. And I, that wasn't the pastorly thing to say, and I didn't say it. But it's what I thought. It wasn't necessarily that what he said was wrong. But there are times when we need to be gracious and loving and kind. So sometimes when we talk about these biblical truths, it may not always be appropriate to bring them up. Or at the very least, we need to be very, be very kind in the way we bring some things up. Because you don't have to beat people up when they're already down, alright? You don't have to remind them of some things because they already know. So, on screen are some teachings that Paul gives us here in this passage. And we can go to that next screen, please. Here we go. The troubles of his life are not as important. I'm sorry. The troubles of this life do not compare to the joys of eternity. You can see that this isn't something you necessarily need to bring up when people are suffering. But when things are going well, this is a good teaching to learn. That the sufferings that you are going to encounter in this life are important to you, yes. But they do not compare to the good things that you will reap into eternity. So when you follow Jesus and you're going through life and you encounter difficulties, they are real and you have a right to suffer and complain and pray about it and all those kinds of things. But just remember, what you're going through right now is temporary. And there will come a time when your sufferings will be over. Not only will this particular time of suffering be over, there will be a time when your life as Christian will be perfect into eternity. So for the Christian who goes through life, if you learn to take that message to heart, when you lose someone or you go through a difficult circumstance, you can be reminded of the fact that, yes, this is real and I hurt. But I understand that someday things will be better. And there is comfort there. And that doesn't mean it's easy. But it means that sometimes the sufferings of this present time pale in comparison to the glory of the time that is to come. We sing that old song in the sweet by and by and there's truth there. We make fun of it. The sufferings of this life are real and you will not escape them. Here is a news flash. Every one of us will get old. We will get ill. We will lose loved ones and ultimately we will face our maker. But for those with faith there is hope in that sense that the sovereign God who's got this is going to take care of us. 
another thing on screen. The Holy Spirit prays for us when we do not know how to pray for ourselves. Sometimes I don't know how to pray. I mean, sometimes I do. Dear God, help this. Work there. The fact is, sometimes I know exactly what I want God to do. Ever feel like that? I just wish God would listen to me because then everything would be fine, right? We would never say that out loud, but that's what we think. And so we pray towards that end. God, if you do this, that'd be wonderful. That would be great, etc., etc. And this is how we think. Sometimes, though, I've been confronted with situations where, to be honest, I don't know what to pray. I don't know that I want necessarily God to take someone's life, but I don't know that necessarily he should be healed or she should be healed or something. Sometimes I just don't understand all the difficulties of a situation or circumstance. And amazingly enough, the scriptures teach us, as Paul said here, that sometimes when you don't know how to pray, but you go to God in prayer and you know you need to do something, and you know you want God to do something, that in those instances, the Holy Spirit is praying for you. So think about this. The Holy Spirit is God himself. Remember, the whole, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And there are times in your life when the Holy Spirit is praying for you. By name. Dear God, be with Christy. Dear God, be with Letha. Dear God, be with Leslie. And that's the way it works. And the Holy Spirit prays for you by name. Now, he may not pray like we want, but he prays that God will do what God in his wisdom can do. And there is comfort. Now, only the God who is sovereign can do this. But God prays for you by name when you don't know what else to do. On screen, we can go to that next screen. God is working in eternity to bring about his will. Look at verse 28, if you would. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So here's the dirty little secret about this life. God can work in the worst situations to bring something good. Doesn't mean the situation is good. Doesn't mean God caused it. But it means that no matter what situation you find yourself in, God can work. So the correct response in every situation is faith. God, I don't understand. God, I'm hurting. God, I, I'm angry. It's all appropriate to say. And then the appropriate thing for every Christian to say is, okay, God, help me. Work as only you can to bring something good. And I'll be honest, in some situations, you can't think of anything. When I think back of that young woman in my first church that was literally dying piece by piece, I could think of absolutely nothing good that was coming out of that situation. But, it did teach a very young preacher that sometimes there are no simple answers. And every time I read a passage about God's sovereignty and how God works, I think of that young woman dying. And I know that God does big things in people's lives. And sometimes he does things to teach people certain things. And I don't understand it. But God can work. In your life, when you can't see it, God can be at work. One other thing here. God works in our lives based upon his foreknowledge of human history. Verses 28 through 30. Follow along again. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Okay, this is probably the most aggravating passage of scripture in the Bible. Because it talks about God predestined people's lives. Predestined in the common mind means God decides what life you get whether you want it or not. And that, that sounds right, doesn't it? Well, it says right here, God predestines our lives. And so it really doesn't matter what I want. God's already determined it. And that's the common understanding. And it is absolutely and perfectly wrong. The phrase for knowledge, and again, look at verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he predestined. To become conformed to the image of his son. So foreknowledge is key here. Which means 
the God who is over all, who's got this, who understands, who's in control, knows what you're going to do next year on Sunday morning at 11.05. And he isn't making you do that. He just knows what you're going to do. And because he knows what you're going to do, it becomes part of official human history before it ever happens. So God writes human history before it happens, not because he plans it out, but because he knows what you're going to do. He knew that Nate was going to marry that cute little girl and have three wonderful little babies. He knew what was going to happen to me when I tried playing with my grandkids yesterday with the train set with 80 little bitty plastic pieces. And God knows all those kinds of things. And what he does is he understands that and that becomes a predestined part of human history. Not because he makes it happen, but because he understands it. So in God's wisdom and glory, when he knows the future, it is official. God knows what's going to happen. So, and, and again, this is the layman's understanding. If you want to get confused, you can go to theological libraries or borrow some of mine, some of my books, and you can be confused and get watered up in big words and things like that. But foreknowledge means God understands before the fact what's going to happen. And when God understands to the future, it's going to happen. Not because he wants it, but because he just knows what's going to happen. So, based on God's foreknowledge, we are pre predestined. And because he knew before you were born that you were going to follow Jesus as Savior, he would place you in this church on this morning. So, Dave, when you received Jesus as Savior, you were doing what God knew you were going to do a gazillion years ago. Before you were born. Before mom and daddy were born. Before grandpa was born. God knew that Dave was going to receive Jesus as Savior and grow up with good parents and end up on staff at a church and all those kinds of things. So, his actions were foreknown by God, so they become predestined because God's wisdom is complete. And so, that's how that works. So, when God knows this, he calls you out. So, he called Dave to follow in faith based on his vision of history and Dave is and will be justified and glorified before God the Father based on what God knew would happen when Dave received Jesus as Savior. See how that works? So it's all based on God's foreknowledge. And like I said, scholars fuss about this and why I don't know. I think it's very simple. It may show how simple I am. But it's all based on God's foreknowledge. God understands the future and because God knows the future, that's it. Now, the reason he brought this up to people in good times was when people are in hard times, they don't want to think about this stuff. They just want to get through it, right? But if you can talk to people in good times and get them to understand how the God who is God is working, then when bad times come, there's a good chance that they will think about this. And they will think, okay, I am suffering but somehow God's working here. And it may not go past that. But it might be enough there to get you through the, the suffering that is part of your life. And it might help you to see that this misery of today is not all that there is. There is more to life than right now. And sometimes that's enough. You will be discouraged in this life. Yes. You will lose loved ones. And you will suffer. But because you understand that your life is predestined by God's knowledge of you, there is hope. Not because you know the future, but because the God who is in control knows the future and is working to bring something good. On screen is a passage of scripture Read this with me, please. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you see that? 
Nothing will separate you from God's love. The love of God which gives us life and hope and strength is ours forever. Because it's not based on you. It's not based on your performance or perfection. It's based upon God's character and promise to us. So there is hope no matter what. So this morning as we talk about the frustrations of life and you feel like quitting. And there are a lot of ways we can quit. Before you quit whatever it is. Ask God, is there something I can learn? Is there something you're doing? Is there a way you're bringing something good here? Help me to understand and give me grace. And then God begins to work. Nathan's going to come and lead us away in a closing hymn of invitation. Let me challenge you and encourage you to make those decisions that will allow God to work in your life. Maybe you need to receive Jesus as Savior. You have some questions about that. Maybe it's time to make a decision about joining a church or something like that. If you want to do something like that, come forward if you'd like. And we'll talk about that or grab me when the services are over. We'll talk. Stand with me please as Nate comes and leads us. Would you be free from the burden of sin? wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power Thank you, Nate. What you see here are our kids bringing out these Christmas bo shoe boxes that we've done. And Dave, are you going to explain all this and talk about it? Okay. And that microphone's dead, so here. <laughs> <laughs> you got one? No. Well, Jane Brown has done a lot of the behind the scenes organizing and collecting, and so we want to thank her for all of that. Um, she said, combined with our online donations, which obviously aren't here, and the shoe boxes that some people filled uh, virtually, that we have over 78. So that was a really a good turnout. So not only do we have these physical boxes that we've returned, but also donations and virtual boxes uh, exceeded our goal. So. We just wanted to take a moment and uh, bless these boxes and where they're going and who they're going to. So if you'll bow with me and then we'll probably close. Okay, great, great. Dear Lord, uh, we take this moment and uh, we're just in awe of uh, your power and the work that you do. Uh, we thank you for um, these gifts uh, that have been collected and, and the givers. Uh, we ask uh, your blessing on these boxes, on these gifts, um, and that the message that uh, these boxes signify um, will be met and the hearts of those that receive them will be open uh, to your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.